So am I, uh, am I able to be heard? Good. Well, just as we've seen, I don't know if it's really accurate to say that I am from artificial intelligence. Doesn't really sound right, does it? Uh, I am a citizen of, uh, of the UK, but I've lived a major part of my life in Singapore and in Sydney and in Seoul, Korea, and I'm now living in New York State. So, uh, yeah, I'm kind of mixed up, I suppose. Anyway, what I'm going to be talking about is artificial intelligence. And I'm particularly looking at it from a point of view of the artificial horizon, which, is, which we are approaching. I'm going to also be talking about uh, robotics. And I'm going to be placing these in the context of um, a dialogue, which I've called the Prophets of Doom and the Doom of Prophets. Actually, the Doom of Prophets being put first in the business of artificial intelligence and in industrial uh, automation and robotics. I should say that I'm the chief technology officer of a robotics company in the States, so that gives you a little bit of perspective of where I'm coming from. Now, AI is booming. Uh, we're talking about 300% growth in the last year. We're talking about uh, Price Waterhouse Cooper uh, claiming that by 2040, there'd be something like, what's the number, $15.7 trillion created by this, these businesses. Just to give you a perspective of that huge number, that's more than double the amount of gold ever mined by humans in the history of the, of the world. It's a huge number. So it's a huge hope. It's a huge utopian goal. And likewise, in industrial robotics and automation, the concept is, is that goods of high quality can be produced at such low cost that we will have this concept of the abundance economy. But what, what's going to happen in terms of jobs? What's going to happen in terms of our culture with the introduction of these te technologies? These are real issues, and this is the main part of the discussion. Likewise, it's not just about factories in industrial robotics. Robots are coming into our homes. Um, artificial intelligence is coming into our homes. There are issues here that I'm going to explore. So let's talk, first of all, about the prospect of superintelligence, a kind of AI that we actually call AGI, Artificial Generic Intelligence. Now, what I would like to draw your attention to is that in the 60s, experts were saying it's 30 years from now, in the 90s. And in the uh, 90s, it was in 2020, 30 years from now. And at 2014, when this data was collected, 2015, 2016, they're saying it's around, or the major cluster is around 2042, more or less. And that's suggesting that it's uh, less than 30 years. So maybe there has been progress in as much as it's coming now below the 30-year horizon. Uh, let us say between 15 and 40 years is a good mark because there's a lot of diversity in this expert opinion. Um, part of the situation that we find ourselves in is well described by a paradigm of industrial revolution. We're familiar from our history books about the first industrial revolution, about steam and mechanical engines. And we are familiar, perhaps, with the Luddite Rebellion that occurred in textiles. I actually come from a town 15 miles away from uh, um, where there was a major Luddite uh, uh, rebellion actions in Helmshaw in, in, in Lancashire. Um, Industry 2.0, the end of the uh, 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, where the revolution or the technology driver was uh, electrical. In the 1950s and 60s, the revolution was in VLSI and microprocessors and digital. And right now, we are in a new industrial revolution of the internet, of the virtual, of the cloud. And there's a new revolution coming very quickly on its heels. Artificial intelligence. Something which is radically capable of changing the world in which we live in and the practices that we take for granted and the culture that we have. And 
robotics has played a part in all of these. There was the jacquard loom in textile mills in the first industrial revolution. And actually robotics can be seen in the electrical, you know, the production lines, production lines of the Ford Motor Company, Henry Ford, is a kind of industrial automation. And again, with robotic arms in the digital era, and now in the connected era, we also have the robots, some of these robots that we find in our homes. So I think I should be pointing over here rather than pointing over here. So basically, what do we have here? I'm talking about now, that was the utopian dream, but there is a dystopian undercurrent here. And in particular, there is the concept that you'll hear about the ex existential threat of artificial generic intelligence, super intelligence. Will these systems be our overlords? Will they be the ones in charge because they can operate well beyond our capabilities and intelligences um, in complex situations that we're incapable of managing? There is also the concern that industrial automation in particular is going to savage our job prospects. Not only in terms of manual labor in an industrial automation setting, but through AI in the white collar industries, legal industries, education sectors, medical and health sectors, and the military are all open for AI to have massive impact. And it's more than just jobs, as I will be pointing out. Are these hopes and fears being overhyped? I'm going to show you some figures, or diagrams, I should say. The first one here talks about the media frenzy. It's been fairly constant. The blue line represents positive um, media coverage of AI. The um, orange line, red line, depicts negative media attention. And currently, up to about 2015, the ratio was 3 to 1 in terms of positive. Now it's more like one-to-one. -one. There is a significant rise in the uh, fears that AI and industrial automation and robotics can deliver. And that's rising dramatically. So fast that we can talk about the expectations of a hype cycle. Are we in this situation where the expectations of industrial automation and robotics is so high that it can't go any further. It has to come down. As we deliver production of these systems, their expectations perhaps will not be met. And then though, if they really do have value, if they really can make contribution to our society, they will rise up to a more realistic expectation. This hype cycle has been seen for many technology innovations in our society. And right now, at the top of expectations are many of those key technologies which relate to AI. So is it hype? AI, perhaps, and robotics, uh, perhaps more than any other technology, is very well depicted in the science fiction stories that you may have all grown up with. There's one here, actually, from Metropolis, a silent black and white movie made in perhaps the 20s, I can't remember now. But then we can see many of these pictures of some of our favorite movies, whether it's Blade Runner or Westworld or iRobot or The Terminator and other such programs. And these often are cautionary tales. They are stories about things that can go wrong. They often feature rebellion. But one of the issues I'm going to put to you is that there may well be a rebellion, but it may not be by the robot. It may be through and for us. OK, so I'm now going to break up my talk into pro the profits of doom and the doom of profits being put first. Let's talk about existential risk. Now, two commentators I personally admire very much for their, for their contribution and capabilities and insight. One is Elon Musk. One is Professor Stephen Hawking. Yet they've been very negative in terms of uh, their fears of AI and industrial automation. Elon Musk, very recently, this week, uh, from a Rolling Stone article, 
It's been talking about the chances of AI being safe as being less than 5 to 10%. I mean, that's basically saying that AI will bring us to doom. And likewise, Stephen Hawking echoes some of those sentiments, though he also mentions in the quotation here that our economies may fail also as a consequence of some of the uh, um, job losses that will occur through industrial automation. So just very quickly, so that I keep to time, however, are those fears really solid and backed up? There are many recent failures if you choose to look for them. For every success story, there are dozens of failures behind them. Making the AI success stories is really hard. We're not in a position where we can roll out AI systems very, very quickly. They have to be tuned. They have to be nursed into existence. There are known technical problems. Um, we struggle to understand issues like consciousness, such as free will, such as self-determination. These are philosophical concepts, and we are trying to, in terms of AGI, pitch those in technological terms. It's not so straightforward. We don't really have an idea what those terms mean. So trying to build technology behind things that we don't really understand is a genuine issue. This is the Mysterian objection, which is saying, as I've said, we don't understand these terms. It may be beyond us to build these systems. The expectation from experts, let's remind ourselves, is 15 to 30, 40 years from now. There is time to fix some of the issues. My last point is that we can potentially fix some of the AGI issues. We can put a firewall of connectivity between the AGI, which we may well be asking for advice, for help us with, with global climate change scenarios, for example, and put those such that they don't control things beyond the firewall. They don't even get access to the internet beyond the firewall unless it's through a narrow, well-controlled dialogue. We can actually fix the safety issue if we have 15 to 20 years to 30 years to do that. And here's a big point. For most of the applications, AGI is totally not needed. If you're having a robot in your home doing your washing up, doing your laundry, cleaning out the cat litter, does it really need to be conscious? If it was, it might not be very happy to be doing those jobs. What we want from the, these robots is to be able to do those jobs without being happy or sad. The motion and consciousness are not part of their makeup. So, moving on. Now to the doom of profit scenario. Well, yes, industrial automation will reduce the amount of robotic jobs that are out there. But just keep in mind what I'm saying. Humans doing robotics jobs is not a humane use of humanity, if I articulated that well. What we really should be aspiring to do is to assign robots to robotic jobs and humans to humane jobs. And it's my belief that there's an infinite opportunity to find humane jobs. There's always need for humans to help other humans in one way or another. Now, we may have to adjust our economies to be able to support that, and that's part of the discussion here. Basically, we may have to change our socioeconomic models. We may have to introduce... Um, concepts such as universal basic income. A whole TED talk and more could be devoted to that point. So I'll just leave it there. Highly immersive AI gaming systems are going to provide us with entertainment at a level never seen before. And we will have the service robots and sex robots available to us. And the impact of those is going to be massive. There are problems in trusting some of the deep learning systems that we have. They are black boxes. We train them, but we can't understand how they've arrived at their decisions. Again, this is a topic that a whole TED talk could be devoted to. So I'll move on. 
There are catastrophic problems in case there are, is hacking, there are, in case there are bugs within the system. And if these systems have been around for a few years, the humans that they've replaced, their skills are not necessarily now available after a, catast after a catastrophe. So the point is of human atrophy. We can't roll back. If we've been working in mission critical systems with AI systems, the possibility is that if they crash, it's going to be difficult to roll back. These are major issues. Now, they can be resolved, but they have to be planned to be resolved. We can't just blunder, or we can. I mean, humankind has had a history of blundering into technological issues. But we have to change that mentality, is my point here. Otherwise, we are ceding moral authority to machines that perhaps we shouldn't be. And we are preparing, perhaps, for a rebellion. But it's not a robot rebellion. It's a human rebellion. So I'm concluding uh, here now, trying to keep within my, my time slot. And basically, my point is, don't worry so much about the AGI superintelligence issues. We can fix those problems. We don't really need AGI in the general community. It's more hype caused by fear than a real risk, in my opinion. But we do need to resolve and take action today on the narrow AI applications, whether they be in health, government, military, legal. And th these can be augmented intelligence. They're not necessarily replacing teachers, replacing lawyers, but maybe they're paralegals and they're paramedics. So that the third point is, is that the economic value, that massive trillion dollar, <laughs> multiple trillion dollar uh, impact will be there for us. And furthermore, that they can help us with some of the genuine existential issues that we have. And issues of bringing services to areas in which they traditionally haven't been available. Bringing health services, legal services, medic, uh, as, as I say, uh, education services to communities which don't necessarily have, at this time, the luxury of, of, of those in, in less well-developed countries. I'm finishing up, as I say, I don't really have time to read through this massive quotation of Professor Daniel Dennett. I do hope that you uh, look it up. I understand you can get a copy of my slides from the organizers. Basically, he echoes my opinion. He calls the concept of uh, artificial general intelligence in the short term balderdash, and he echoes my position about that we mustn't cede our moral authority to uh, narrow AI in the short term. So, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, there is an opportunity here to make our future, to get the utopia, but it's going to need us to do things differently. We mustn't blunder into the business of usual prediction. This particular graph shows a 60, 10%, 30% for positive business as usual, so-called neutral, and 30% uh, uh, likelihood of a uh, negative um, pers perspective. Maybe, maybe not. But the point is, is that business as usual is not good enough. Business as usual has got us into the climate change position. It's not good enough. We must become change masters. We must build our society. We must take active control. And with that, I hand over to the youngsters in the audience. Because it's you that are going to make this difference into the, to this planet. It's you that need to be engaged on this subject. So excuse my passion, but I need you. Thank you very much.